Welcome back, stranger. I'm working on a OM1N today. And that's what we're going to be looking at. I made a video a few months ago on the OM1, but not the N model. The N model was the one they made after. They made some improvements on it. Uh, the meter switch on the previous OM1 was not a very good design, so they changed that, which I was very grateful. And uh, I'm sure they made some other um, changes inside the camera, and uh, we'll look at them together. Let's get started. Um, we'll start with the top cover, which is what I usually start with. Bring this over here. This camera here. The Olympus OM-1 was, uh, for its time, a very unusual camera. A Maverick, I guess you'd call it. Uh, they didn't follow standard um, camera layout. The uh, Most cameras put the um, speed control here. Uh, Olympus uh, put a uh, ASA knob here, a very large one. The thing is, is that once you uh, set the ASA in a camera, you rarely change it while you're shooting. So it was kind of wasted space in a way to have such a large knob here. Uh, right up here where control should be. And on this side, they put this huge switch, which uh, was a good switch. Here, clicking there. And handy because you immediately knew if your camera was uh, meter was on or off, so you wouldn't run your battery down. The um, Minolta's had their switch on the bottom, which was not a very good place because um, you had no way of knowing if your camera was on or off just by glancing at it, especially if it was like in a case. Then you had to pull it out of the case to turn the uh, battery uh, or the meter on and off. Nikon put their switch on their advanced levers. When the lever was in, it was off. When it's pulled out from the camera, it was on. That was probably the best system of all of them. But uh, Olympus went their own way and designed their own camera. Over here is the uh, counter, film counter. And here, of course, is your release. The um, camera inside is a um, pretty well standard layout. This actually is not the meter switch. It's just that it reaches down and changes it. Same way with this uh, huge ASA control. Went over and control the, uh, change the ASA, but the ASA control is not actually in the top cover. I think this top cover is made of aluminum. I could be wrong. It's awfully light. The um, OM, they came out first, the OM-1. And then they came out with an OMN. This is the N model. I did another video about a month or two ago, and it was on the OM1. This one will be slightly different inside. They um, had some problems. The first uh, switch on the uh, OM1 was not a very good design, and it had problems. And so they redesigned the uh, meter switch, which, which was a good idea. And they made a few other changes to it also. Also, the Olympus did not have a hot shoe up here. It, um, the control, um, what am I trying to say? The contact, instead of being mounted on the top cover, was mounted on, on top of the prism on a bracket. And then uh, you attached your um, hot shoe bracket, or not bracket, your, um, well, I guess it's just a hot shoe. You, uh, it was an accessory. You put your hot shoe and you screwed it onto it. And um, the advantage of this is that the camera could be a small, lot smaller and lighter because um, well, the cameras that had a hot shoe built in, you couldn't remove it. So it made the top of the camera stick up further. And uh, having it uh, recessed like this kind of gave it a nice slick design. The camera was, um, trying to describe it for the time, felt like a rangefinder, but it was an SLR which is very nice. The camera caught on. People liked it, and they sold real well. Like I said, I bought one myself. Also, another thing the Olympus different is that most cameras had their, um, their sprocket, um, sprocket their, um, when they rerun their film, they had to release it, and the release on most cameras was on the bottom. Uh, Olympus put it up here on the top. The control that uh, changes it goes through here. So a very different design. Part of the reasons um, 
I give these uh, lessons is uh, to throw in a little bit of history for those of you that were born before these cameras were actually being made. This is the bottom cover. Um, I can't turn it over because the customer put his, uh, he etched on his name and some other personal information. The, uh, but I can tell you it was in very good condition. The, uh, let's see if I got the right, yeah, I got the right camera on. There was only one big dent here and it was pretty pronounced. I pressed it out as best as I could with a mallet, but um, you can never get um, dents and dings out of uh, top covers and bottom covers completely. The only way you can, you have to buy another cover. It's in mint condition. And this over here is the cover for the motor drive. And these were always getting lost and the customers, when they would send the cameras to me, they'd say, they want this replaced. And then this, of course, was the uh, battery compartment. You can see the plus sign there. And uh, that's where you put your battery in, of course. Okay, let's move along. Up. Oh. <laughs> I'll have to edit that out. Okay, we're recording. Next thing we're going to look at is the mirror cage on the OM-1. A um, comment in my section on my channel, a customer, a customer, a uh, viewer told me that he took the uh, front of his uh, OM-1 apart and that um, the strings say here and here had come off and um, this part had come off and everything was loose and how to put it back together. <laughs> and uh, it's nothing I can really explain. Actually, I uh, wanted to empathize with him and feel sorry, but basically if um, someone takes that all apart and it gets loose, they're screwed. A camera repairman can put it back together, but uh, an amateur who is not doesn't know what's going on, he could but it might take him days to do it. And so um, they shouldn't take this um, front of the uh, OM-1 apart unless they know what they're doing. And I will, I don't know if I can explain how it works, but I can kind of show you where everything's at. Maybe that's a better explanation than try to say, well, this is how this works. The... Um, Rings here are plastic that have teeth on them. There's two of them. And there's a set of strings and pulleys. And there's some timing gears here and here. And what they do is this galvanometer, they move it left and right, or forward and backward maybe is a better way of putting it. And get this blue wire out of the way. I was saying, get this blue wire out of the way so we can see down in here. I need to go higher. This is why I don't do tutorials, because they're hard to do. This uh, needle here on the galvanometer is what you set your exposure with. That I'm pushing everything around, there it is. And um, you want to center it right here in this uh, bracket. It's got a plus and a minus sign. When you're looking through the viewfinder here and you see that bracket and that needle, and I know it's not quite in focus, but I'm not gonna go back and reshoot this. It's too much work. Um, that needle has to be centered to be properly exposed. And the way that's done is this galvanometer moves this way and this way. I don't know how many degrees, but it turns. And the reason it does turn is because of this, these two rings here and this series of strings and pulleys and the timing. It's not electronic, it's all mechanical. 
And the needle also is controlled by two photocells here and here. And as the lights hit the photocells, it um, charges magnets inside and moves this needle also. So you've got two things moving the needle. You've got the uh, photocells and the resistance caused by the light. And then you have the galvanometer mechanically being turned this way and this way and being controlled up here. Well, you say, well, what are these? This tab here is, con is connected to your speed ring. And I'm going to find it here in a second. Here it is. And I'm sorry this is such a mess, but I don't want to go back and reshoot it. It's too much work. It's like making a tutorial. There's your speed ring. Here's your notch that goes to that uh, ring I was showing you. Put this back aside. Well, we're going to have to go through this kind of quick or we're going to be here all day. Down here. And then that is connected to this gear right here, which goes down, connected to intermediate gear, which goes to this timing um, mechanism here. I don't know what you would call a timing mechanism, but you can see a gear here and a gear here. And there's a string that goes around it. I don't know if we can see the string. Well, we can see part of it. Here's where it attaches. You see the string that's... <laughs> I'll get it here in a second. This string is attached here. Goes over the pulley right here. And then goes back and wraps around this wheel here. As you can see, even this wheel has, has a gear here and a gear here that's attached to the galvanometer, which rotates it. And then the second part of this is um, underneath this particular ring here is the second ring. And when you change the f-stop, you move this up and down also. It rotates that uh, bottom gear, or the, not the gear, but um, this... Um, <laughs> I don't know what to call that. What would you call that? It's plastic. It's round. It's uh, geared. Both of them are. And it's connected to here. Again, this is a timing gear, I guess you would call it. And uh, the string on it, like I said, goes back to the galvanometer. Well, this needs to be spring-loaded. So when the... Uh, f-stop on the lens is changed if it's pushed up it's got to snap back and the way that's done is this top string here is attached to it and if you come back here goes over the pulley and there's your spring which keeps tension on it and then it's tied to a post up here in place. So as you change the f-stop on your lens, I'm going to move this aside for a second. I know this is uh, not of interest to many people, only maybe the people that would repair it. A uh, OM-1. As I Look at this right here, this post here. You can see it moving as I change my f-stop. That um, post moves this right here. But like I said, if it gets up in this area, it needs to snap back to this point here. And that's what this string here for. It uh, keeps tension on it with the spring in the back. So this whole mess here, it has to be timed properly. In other words, I mark it with uh, red paint here, and I scored it here. Any camera I go into, I always paint and mark them and score them. Uh, we call them uh, timing marks in the business. 
to make sure that uh, when we reassemble the camera, it saves us time. For uh, an amateur, like the, the person that uh, left the comment, there's no marks, there's no scores, so he would just have to, by trial and error, try putting this in different teeth, and this teeth here on the bottom one, over and over and over again, until he uh, got the correct combination. And that might take a, a day or days. A camera repairman kind of knows where they're supposed to be, and uh, he can adjust it. A good starting point is, <laughs> and I'm not uh, telling people how to repair this camera, but this right here would be your um, speed controlled tab. It needs to be in this position, not over here or anywhere, but right here in the uh, f-stop tab needs to be here against this tab. If those are both in the, that position, then this needs to be inserted and uh, these two need to be engaged with this gear and then this uh, needs to be inserted in that position you can kind of count how many teeth here it is to it to it engages in this uh, video. And then this wheel here, as you lift this up and put it down, it's the bottom one, it engages this gear here. And you see this little brass gear here. It needs to be at about three o'clock. And so if the whole thing were just came in and a customer had taken it apart, that's where I would start. I would set this, I would set this, I would uh, set this, and then I would uh, lift this up and put it down in the teeth here until this little brass gear here was at three o'clock. And then I would have to reassemble the camera and uh, test the exposure. And if it wasn't right, I'd have to do it again and maybe move it down to like 4 o'clock or 2 o'clock. Trial and error, back and forth, until I got it right. And I'm someone who's been doing it for years, so I kind of know what I'm doing. For somebody who uh, is an amateur, this would be a nightmare. Like I said, the string here goes around this wheel. I've seen it where it came off, and it was loose in here. So it needs to be also wrapped around that wheel also. And then the string has to be over these two pulleys here and here. And I've seen a case where the strings off the pulleys and I had to put them back. Here you can see the pulleys here and here. And that's why I said the um, amateur took his camera apart was really was screwed because that's complicated even for me I would dread having to put it all back together I rarely take this apart and go in here unless there's a problem okay we're gonna set this aside and I'm gonna just for this video I grabbed another mirror cage and took the plate off as you can see, the strings goes down to the bottom of this right here and wraps around it. And as this, I call it a timing gear, a timing wheel rotates, it controls that string, which controls the galvanometer. And that, uh, this gear here and here are just intermediates. The gear that goes here, I left out, but it uh, transfers energy over to this timing gear here. Very complicated. This gear here actually engages that one. Uh, <laughs> why Olympus decided to go with such a complicated mechanical system, I have no idea. Most. Uh, cameras are not this complicated 
And I don't know if I explained it very well. It's obvious to me as a camera repairman how it works. But to somebody who doesn't repair cameras, it um, maybe doesn't make any sense. So let's see here what we can do to give a, to give you that aha moment. Yeah, I understand now how it works. Okay, I put a uh, lens on this uh, mirror cage, which is assembled. Nobody's going to want to see this video. Waste of time. I uh, drew a line on the galvanometer here, and that uh, line is what you're going to want to watch to understand what's going on. Now up here is the f-stop. Now I'm going to change it. You see now the galvanometer, how it's turning. And also if you look down here, you can see the wheel turning as I change the galvanometer. And the galvanometer, if you look down in here, and I know it's not quite in focus, but um, I've spent enough time making this video and it's kind of pointless. You can see the needle moving as the uh, galvanometer is turning. Okay, that's one. And now we go to uh, speeds. I'm, the speeds right here on the camera as I turn it. If you look down there, you'll see the needle moving back and forth. The speeds also are turning. Look at this uh, line here I drew. Watch it. You see it moving? Okay. That is an example of what I've been trying to explain here. So you can better understand that uh, this top, and I wished I knew what to call it, wheel here, geared wheel, there's one on top, one underneath, engaged with this, engaged with this timing wheel, a string that goes back to the galvanometer here, the top string is just to tension this right here. And that's what all that's for if you get everything in the right place. Like take for instance this right here. It just lays on top and I'm going to try to lift it off. And I did. It has, there's no string on that one and it just lifts off. This is the bottom one. It's geared also, or it has teeth on it, but they're underneath, you can't see them. And here's your um, a tab that uh, engages your lens. Here is your string that goes back to your galvanometer. And this string here, I told you is to tension. It goes to this uh, wheel also. So when you push it back to up here, the lens, when you set your f-stop and it goes up here, when you remove your lens or change your f-stop, it snaps back to this beginning point. I don't know if any of this has made any sense to you. It's um, something that you... Um, a camera repairman who does it all the time intuitively understands, but for anybody who's um, not a repairman, it um, maybe doesn't make any sense or it looks like a nightmare. And so maybe you can understand a little bit when, uh, why when the uh, 
people uh, email me and say, well, how do you fix this or how do you fix that? I, I just want to throw up my hands and go, oh, no, not again. I can't explain it. You have to repair cameras to understand these things and how they work. The um, We'll cover one or two more things and call it quits here on this mirror cage. The um, new switch on the end model was much better than the old one. The old one just had um, t a wire here that made contact and the wire quite often uh, didn't make good contact or it got bent and uh, didn't make contact at all. And I repaired many of them uh, because the meter would not turn on. But this new system, it has, um, you just turn it and it, the contact slide here and here and uh, turn it on or off. And then uh, I told you this particular camera does not have a, a flash shoe attached to it. It's uh, down here on this bracket attached to the viewfinder. And when you uh, buy the accessory uh, flash shoe, the contacts come down and touch these contacts and makes it work. It uh, kept you from having to have a flash shoe on a camera that, uh, you know, if you don't use one, which was very handy. So we had the new on off switch and then we had the um, contacts here for the flash. Self timer here. Self timer is always large on these cameras. That is enough. Let's move on to the body. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is the uh, body, which is usually the final thing I look at. I'm in my close up lens right now, and the focus seems to be cooperating, so we'll go ahead and stay with that right now. The um, most camera manufacturers at that time put the uh, timer or the shutter up here, but um, Olympus put it here in the base of the bottom. And that's one reason the mirror cage is open on the bottom is to make room for this right here. This um, timer, um, without question, is the most accurate of all the uh, mechanical cameras um, that I've tested. They kind of look crude and dirty, but if they're kept clean, the uh, exposure times on the shutter are extremely accurate. I can charge it up here. You can see your um, closing curtain, opening curtain. If I can get my hand out of the way. And I'm charging it now. I've got the uh, cam set right now at uh, one second and I will trip it and you see how good that sounds nice and smooth only a camera repairman could love that sound probably if you'll be looking right here you'll see it timing out and over here you'll see it uh, releases your shutters on most cameras, you can't see that action. On this one, you can. Again. Anyway, the um, very good design, but um, as with most of the uh, OM-1 uh, manufacturing, it uh, Kind of looks crude. Uh, Nikon would never turn out anything that looks so bad as that. That uh, looks dirty, but uh, it works just fine. It's just, uh, you know, like the um, when they put their glue on, they, uh, they don't do a very nice job. And uh, you can see some here, some here. This... Um, timer here has to be oiled and uh, this release wheel here also has to be oiled the shutter you can see the shafts here and here and I'm blocking the light 
and you can see it there and here and here those all have to be oiled um, shutters on these uh, mechanical range finders uh, after a while they dry out and when they dry out the shutters start becoming uh, jumpy or inconsistent and uh, on some of the uh, manuals it says that uh, the camera's lubricated for life and the uh, shutter rollers don't need lubrication but that would have been true if the camera lasted 10 or 20 years but uh, some of these cameras now are getting up 40 years old or more and uh, they have to be oiled I use my shutter tester and I check them I uh, check my uh, the speeds before I oil them and then after I oil them and I can definitely tell you the uh, the uh, rollers on the shutters have to be oiled this um, right here I showed you on the top cover releases the sprocket here come on focus there for rewinding the uh, film most uh, cameras put the release down here on the bottom Olympus selected to put it up here on the top the winding mechanism is um, pretty much standard nothing unusual about that it um, is the same as on the uh, the other major uh, SLRs major makers that time this camera came out I may have said or may not have said uh, earlier in around 74 75 a very light camera a um, it felt like a range carrying around a rangefinder but uh, took uh, fine pictures and it was an SLR this is a failure point which is every camera has some failure point on this camera it was right here this uh, little mechanism when you advance the uh, camera maybe I can advance the camera let's see here watch it you see how it's turning around and when it gets to the end it will snap back I don't know if you saw that this charges the camera these two wheels here charge it but then the spring snaps them back well what would happen is that they would go to the beach or someplace where there was sand and sand would get in the bottom of the camera and the spring that uh, snaps these back is very weak and it would only take one grain of sand or a couple and they wouldn't snap back and if they don't snap back then they wouldn't mate properly with this uh, charging gear here if any of that makes sense to you so what would happen is they would bring it to me I'd have to remove this gear and this gear clean the sand out or whatever was causing the, the problem uh, put the spring and these two gears back and then send the customer on his way and uh, everything was fine but you don't want to get the uh, OM-1 anywhere near sand because it will work its way into these two gears here another failure point of the OM-1 was this battery compartment of all the cameras I worked on the OM-1 was the worst about uh, battery acid ruining the wires battery acid would uh, get leak in here and get in this brown wire and uh, it was always brown and it connected here and that brown wire went um, through there up here out the top and over here to the switch and I have seen that wire turn uh, uh, green with acid all the way to the switch how that happens I don't know but somehow the battery acid wicks its way through that wire all the way up there and uh, what you have to do is unsolder it here and then replace that whole wire and I've done that many many times I keep telling customers to uh, replace the battery once a year even if it's still good you don't want to take a chance of battery acid getting into your camera because uh, then you, you got to bring it to me and I'm going to charge you several hundred dollars to uh, repair the damage it's just not worth it uh, a five dollar battery just uh, replace it even if it still looks good do it like on your birthday or something the battery uh, over a year is going to um, lose strength anyway and like a 1.5 might drop to a 1.45 or something so 
Uh, even if it still looks good, just toss it and put in another battery. Much cheaper than uh, taking it to a camera repair shop and having it uh, repaired for a battery acid leak. Okay, there's probably more, but that's more than enough about the uh, body on the OM-1. If there's more, well, I'll cover it in my next video. And that's pretty much it. Let's move on.